Well, I enlisted in the in the United States Navy in um, August of 1978, and I ended up on board the USS America, uh, where unfortunately I sustained some injuries on the flight deck uh, while performing my duties. And in a roundabout way, uh, since that, ended up at Sinclair Fleet uh, Atlantic Command Support Facility in Norfolk, Virginia, on Hampton Boulevard and uh, was directly assigned to LOSF Division 22, which were a group of about 11 people then. Um, we were directly responsible for briefing Admiral Train. We briefed him on current military operations around the world, what the Soviets were doing that day, what they had done the night before. LOSF, uh, is just an acronym for Atlantic Operational Support Facility. And uh, Sinclant Fleet is another acronym for Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet, which Admiral Train was at the time. Everyone on the Eastern Seaboard answered to this man. I was granted, uh, after a six month wait, a top secret special compartmented intelligence clearance uh, with a uh, zebra stripe identification badge which permitted uh, access to all facilities on the base at all times. Um, I had unrestricted access to any facility at any time as well as the command center uh, which it was specifically granted for so that I could be up on the mezzanine or the third deck as we called it up over the, the uh, command center to make sure that any ingoing, incoming and outgoing audio video um, information that came into the uh, command center was recorded uh, and duly logged for reference or if they needed it for later. We're recording every, all the video and audio of everything that's going on even when they set what was called a condition zebra alert, which was generally a training exercise. They would announce it beforehand, this is a drill, this is a drill, set condition zebra. And unauthorized personnel would be escorted out of the command center. It's the highest level of alert that the Navy has or had at that time for dealing with, uh, generally for, gen for generally dealing with uh, global nuclear threats, in particular the Soviets. Um, Soviet Bearcats would routinely patrol up and down the eastern seaboard uh, watching what we were doing and um, we would set a condition zebra if we had the need to put planes in the air to escort the Bearcats if they were a little clo too close to our airspace or if they had ships in the area that were being a little um, suspicious acting, for instance. Or they would have a, a drill, for instance, where they would get at the mad books, they called them. The watch officer and the J junior watch officer, the J-O-D, had keys to a safe. And they would get these books out, all the mad books, Mutual Assured Destruction, and they would have the codes that were necessary to transmit to the submarines out in the uh, watching stations to, uh, if necessary, to launch a nuclear strike. And not many people were allowed in the command center because they actually did use the uh, codes and so forth uh, that um, I'm sure the Soviets and any other persons who were enemies of the United States would have loved to have got their hands on. The zebra classification, without that, you were not allowed uh, uh, authorized access to these facilities during this, this drill. And this, the zebra drill was specifically for uh, the highest level of top secret information that was being exchanged between the command center and ships and or submarines at sea. Well, the day started out pretty routine. I uh, had gotten a cup of coffee. It was uh, early in the summer, and uh, I'd say around um, the first week or two in May, to the best of my knowledge. So everything was going along pretty just ho-hum routine. And um, they dimmed the lights first in the command center when they set a conditioned zebra alert. Always dim the lights first. 
they turn the lights down, and most of the times when they set these drills, they would say, this is a drill, this is a drill, set condition zebra. And, but they turned the lights down this time, and they didn't say, this is a drill. And the watch officer and the junior watch officer looked at each other and said, you know, we're told um, some of their assistants to verify whether or not this was a drill as the event was taking place. And um, our early warning system off uh, the, uh, I would think, I believe it came in from uh, the Air Force Base in Greenland at that time, to the best of my knowledge, or perhaps an early warning station up as far as Nova Scotia. Um, that we had contact with an unidentified flying object that had entered uh, our airspace. And they said that this was not a drill, and so it was uh, treated with the utmost uh, promptness, and uh, everyone started just, you know, running around like uh, mad, you know, once they realized it wasn't a drill, and it took on a, a whole different air. and. Um, Within moments of that, the uh, watch officer summoned Admiral Train over to the command center because this was a little out of his uh, area of authorization, for lack of a better way to put it. It required Admiral Train's oversight. And within minutes, Admiral Train was rushed into the command center, into his viewing booth that he had right under the mezzanine there. and. Uh, the first thing that Admiral Train wanted to know was how many contacts we had, where they were, which direction were they going, and were the Soviets responding. Because we knew it wasn't the Soviets that had entered our airspace. That was verified from the get-go, from the very start. And at that point, when uh, Admiral Train found out that the, it wasn't the Soviets, and that he wanted to know were the Soviets responding to this threat also, that was the end moment that he gave authorization to put two planes up to go see what this thing was. And that's when it all, the chasing up and down, you know, began. Uh, we launched planes from as far north as Greenland to um, NAS Oceana. And um, this object, we had it on radar for, oh, this event probably lasted, uh, oh gosh, almost an hour perhaps. And Pilots, you could hear the pilots' live voice transmissions being piped into the command center, uh, visual confirmation on the object, description of the objects. Uh, pilots were able to close a couple of times and be able to see that the, uh, the object was not an, uh, an aircraft that uh, we were familiar with, was nothing that we had, was nothing the Soviets had, and that was determined very quickly. And uh, this, this vehicle that, or plane or whatever it was that they were chasing, uh, showed very erratic flight up and down the coast, very quick flight. It would actually be off the coast of Maine, for instance, and would leave airspace in that area so quickly that we were having to have planes uh, coming out of uh, Dover Air Force Base to pick it up just in what seemed like moments. Uh, and would take. Well, I know for a fact it would take, uh, you know, an F-14 probably 30 minutes to traverse that much distance. But this this object, whatever it was, was just popping up. Just, you know, one minute it was here, and the next minute, bam, it was down, you know, several hundred miles, you know, uh, down the coast, uh, just playing tag. It did go all the way down to uh, a point off the coast of Florida around Mayport, uh, the, the naval air station we have down there at Cecil Field, or had at that time, I think it's closed now. And that was before it turned and took a, well it would have been an easterly direction from our vantage point back out towards the Azores before we actually lost track of it. And during all this, we have satellites um, called the KH-11 uh, satellites that we use uh, for um, information gathering. And uh, this satellite does have a, did have a very high capability of uh, taking really good photographs of things uh, literally within just a few feet of the ground uh, from a you know, vantage point out in outer space. And they were trying to get the KH-11 satellite to track this thing to get some photographs of it. And uh, they did, the, the satellite, the photographs that we did get back into the command center later on came from uh, 
the first encounters that the planes had with it up off the North American coast. They did get close enough to uh, get some, uh, some photographs taken that were later brought over to the, um, uh, to the command center. Well, from the photograph, I could remember the shape. What I would have said would have been uh, more like a, um, well, it was, it was quite flat. It was long. I would say a, I would say a cylinder. I would say a cylinder because it was abrupt. It had abrupt ends. They didn't take the ends didn't taper down like most aircraft. It just came to an abrupt end, um, and and it did appear to be reflecting sunlight uh, because you could clearly tell it was metallic, uh, or appeared to be clearly metallic. And um, the pilots, uh, they were giving information such as uh, it was not ev it was not uh, leaving behind a vapor trail. Um, no discernible lights, markings on it, uh, no windows, cockpit windows, doors, nothing like that. It seemed to be just one solid thing, whatever it was. What was really bugging Dr. Uh, Admiral Train out, I'm sorry, that was what was really driving him nuts was this thing absolutely had con complete control of the situation and could just be wherever it wanted to be just in a m matter of seconds. Uh, one minute we're you know, closing on it, you know, um, off the coast of Maine. The next minute, it's in Norfolk, headed south towards Florida. And it's all we can do to alert the, uh, get the early warning radar up down the coast to, you know, watch for this thing as it just had its day with us, just uh, toying with us, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to put it. And, uh, and Admiral Train and his staff were, uh, they were quite concerned about it, to say the least. They were quite concerned, um, especially once they found out that it wasn't the Russians and it wasn't us. And he wasn't aware of anyone else who had the technology to build such a craft that could, whatever it was, could move around, about so easily uh, and so quickly. And um, I remember distinctly looking over the, um, the rail over the mezzanine there over the third deck and just watching uh, complete chaos, you know, break out because of uh, their inability to keep a, tr you know, to keep an eye on this thing, whatever it was then, yeah. The thing was moving around so erratically and so quickly up and down the coast, they were trying to notify as many commands as they could up and down the coast to track this thing or get a plane up, uh, as Admiral Train was doing, he was scrambling, authorizing planes up just left and right, uh, up and down the whole eastern seaboard. And to try and cut this thing off, uh, you know, to, to get some planes coming in on it from the north and the south, for instance, to kind of, uh, well, to literally trap it, you know, to, to force it down. It was clear that they wanted it, they wanted to recover it, to force it down or uh, by whatever means possible. The order was given by Admiral Train uh, to try and get this object forced down out of the sky, if at all possible, by whatever means possible. And that was, as I had said before, after they found out and knew for certainty that it wasn't the Russians. And after the, we found out it wasn't the Russians, uh, they didn't care who it was as long as it wasn't the Russians. They didn't care who it was or where it was from. They wanted it and wanted it bad. The information coming into the command center was being relayed to us from different radar sites that we have up and down the sea, you know, eastern coast that watch our airspace. The only descriptions that I recall that the pilots actually made were that they could not find any markings on the aircraft. Uh, they could not find any uh, visible signs that the thing had wings, a tail, windows, a cockpit, uh, or anything like that, or any markings from any country. I would describe him as being um, Scared, yeah, just, you know, yeah, scared, yeah, to put it in a nutshell, yeah. Uh, he was usually a very calm man of, you know, very mild demeanor, just a really nice fellow. And um, you didn't ever really see him lose control, raise his voice, get excited about anything, but... 
this really got really got him uh, really had him upset to say the least uh, and that was I'd say that was the impression that I had from most of the officers that, that were with him they were just uh, they were just as much in the dark and uh, scared as everybody else they would not actually track it down the coast he would just appear uh, hundreds of miles from its last sighting and the pilots would it would just one moment it was there and the next moment it wasn't and I think that was one of the things that really had Admiral Train's hackles up because the, the, he didn't have any control over it or the situation. This thing just had a mind of its own and was causing such an uproar up and down the eastern coast and him being ultimately responsible at that time. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was stressing him out quite a great, great deal, which you could tell by his tone of voice. You could just tell, you know, by listening to him that he was, uh, he was very, very, very worried. But on radar, it, it was very unusual that the radar information that was coming into us that we were keeping track of was they would absolutely lose, lose it one moment and then we would pick it up. It would just appear in, as an unauthorized vehicle in, uh, in military airspace, for example. And trust me, the military knows where every commercial flight is at all times. They knew, we knew where every plane we had was at all times. We knew where every commercial flight coming through our airspace was at all times. Um, there just wasn't anything going on that we didn't know about it. I mean, literally, there wasn't anything going on that we didn't know about. All the planes that were scrambled that were put up off of shore facilities, because the Navy has um, shore facilities, you know, the Naval Air Stations, for example, Oceana. When you set a condition zebra, uh, whether it's a drill or not, people who are not authorized to be there who don't who do not have a zebra access badge, it's a zebra stripe badge on your clearance badge. They have to leave the command facility um, and we have Marines stationed outside the building there, in the building and as well as outside that were under orders to shoot any unauthorized personnel that remained in the command center during one of these episodes. And um, that was in supposedly for interest of national security. There's a door right here and this guy, the Marine comes in and wants to know uh, what's going on, is this a drill or so forth. He, you know, they've got orders to start shooting people. And I know because I actually got the junior OOD's attention and said, hey, you guys need to tell this guy something. He's ready to start shooting people, you know, uh, because they haven't told him to stand down yet. And, uh, and which he did, and I remember, you know, wanting to just get the hell out of there. You know, because they were, well, he came in and, you know, and if he said, if I, you've got oh, a minute or two, if I don't find out something, oh, they were ready to come in and start shooting people. Yeah. Yeah. Destroying evidence and, uh, yeah. When this that. event, as, as I referred to it, ended, uh, the object that we were, had, had been chasing up and down the seaboard and not really getting a whole hell of a lot of uh, information from and uh, just playing, you know, tag with this thing. It headed out towards over the Atlantic, towards the Azores. And I don't know who was responsible for getting this information or who actually had it or how they had actually gotten it. But I do remember them saying that it had pulled up at a 66 degree angle when it approached, as it approached the Azores like this. And it just pulled up at a 66 degree angle without slowing down or anything and left the, at the atmosphere just was gone. He just took off into space and was gone and just like that. And um, I mean it just absolutely left. I mean you're talking about something that covered thousands of miles in the blink of an eye and it was just gone. And it just left everyone sitting around scratching their heads. You know, gee whiz, wonder what that was. It was comical in a way to see how the the vast military might of the United States being put on its knees by something they had no idea what it was, where it came from, where it was going, or anything. I mean, and the only thing that they knew for sure was that it wasn't the Soviets. And they were very adamant about finding that out, whether or not it was something new the Soviets had came up with. We secured from Condition Zebra. They turned the lights up. You know, uh, 
Everyone's sitting around talking about it. You know, down on the command floor. I'm up here by myself on the third deck. Admiral Train is down here in his briefing area. Uh, they stayed for a few minutes before they left. And everyone's just, you know, making idle chit-chat about it and so forth and so on. I made a log of it, in, a note of it in my log book, like you had to do, and uh, really didn't give it much more thought. These two guys came in in suits. They weren't in military uniform. They just came in in suits and, you know, had their little uh, badges on. Uh, they didn't have zebra stripe clearances. It was like a visitor's badge. They didn't, they weren't, per you could tell they weren't personnel there. And uh, I didn't know them, Tom, Dick from Harry. I'd never seen these guys before. So we go out of Division 22 and we go downstairs to the first floor and there's, there are several little conference rooms and so forth. And they took me into one they already had set up and um, set me down, and they had my log book. You know, they got that and took it down with me. And, and uh, these two gentlemen became, began to uh, question me about this event. And I remember, you know, saying to them, uh, they, were, they were being pretty rough, you know, about it, to be honest with you. And uh, I remember telling them, literally putting my hands up and going, wait a minute, fellas, I'm on your side. You know, whoa, just a minute, because they were, they were not being, they were not really nice. They were very intimidating and made it quite clear to the point that nothing that was seen, heard, or witnessed that transpired during that was to leave this building. You not to say a word to it about to it about your coworkers and uh, off base. You know, just forget everything. You may have seen or heard or whatever concerned with this. It didn't happen. But they were nice, nasty, I guess is a good way to put it. And I distinctly remember sitting back in my chair and I put my hands up and had to tell these guys, wait a minute, hey, we're on the same side, fellas. You know, we don't have a problem here uh, because you got, the, uh, you got the impression that they would do bodily harm to you otherwise. I mean, without really coming out and threatening you. Their tone of voice, well, you can just tell. You know, someone's, you know, letting you know, hey, buddy, do, you know, do what I say or else. If this object had been hostile uh, and wanted to drop weapons or shoot missiles at us or whatever, oh, they, they would have been very, it would have been very easy for them to do that. There was no question about that. And I'm not a pilot. We don't have anything or didn't have anything at that time that could hold a candle to whatever this was, and it was just had its own free run of the of our airspace and could do anything it wanted as far as traveling at will. Uh, we did not pose any threat to it whatsoever. That was painfully painfully obvious, uh, very very much so. I do believe that Admiral Train knew that too and was quite afraid that that just might just might happen. Yeah, because. Uh, yeah, just in a word, I'd say that, that that old boy was scared, just plain old scared. What happened to uh, the 35 millimeter slides that we had? We never got around to putting them up on the telesign for Admiral Train to actually view. They were just prepared. Her, I can remember her telling me that they came in, got up all the film, you know, developed and undeveloped, and all the materials they had with it and the slides. And my logbook, I never did see that again. I know we had a new logbook the next day, a brand spanking new one start with and that disappeared and I don't know what happened to it nobody really knew what happened to it she said the guys uh, same guys came in that took me downstairs that same day they had already been over there to her lab because she was asking me what happened she said you know what was going on what happened you know she said these two guys came in here and read us the riot act and wanted you know uh, this that and the other and rounded up all this stuff and, and it went down as just an unidentified flying object we never, they never did know what it was. They never did know what it was. They just logged it off, literally, as an unidentified flying object, literally. I remember the watch officer and the J-O-D and the O-O-D, officer of the deck and the junior officer of the deck, I do remember them looking at each other talking. And I'm just hanging my head over listening. You know, and they're talking to each other about how to put it in their log books. You know, what, you know, how we're going to do this. He just said, put it down as an unidentified flying object contact. And that's it. Now, whether they were whether they got the same third degree as I did from these other two guys, I would think so. I would think everybody that was in the command center got it. I would say that the, the facilities that actually had this thing on radar, five that I'm sure of, and that's from Greenland all the way to Florida, five that I'm sure of. Now, there may be some others, but 
but I don't know. But yeah, I'm really aware of. And that's because I knew that because Admiral Train was giving orders uh, to see if, you know, uh, NAS Oceana, you know, let's get some planes up from there, scramble some fighters. Uh, he did make a call for them to alert Dover Air Force Base, um, Patuxent River, Maryland, um, Cecil Field down in Florida. When I got out, I received a, an official United States Navy document on the Navy letterhead. They gave me this document where for five years, uh, I w it was absolutely out of the question. I could not leave the country under any circumstances whatsoever. And to leave the state of Virginia, I had to contact the Roanoke office of the FBI and let them know if I just wanted to cross the state line down here to go into North Carolina or, or just leave the state of Virginia. I had to let the FBI know about it. And that was for five years after I was discharged. I was going to tell you about this guy. Jack Booth is his name. He's dead now, but he was in the Army and he was stationed at Roswell uh, when the Roswell incident happened. And uh, it's my wife's uncle, uh, my wife's mother's brother. There were a bunch of these kids. He was from Bluefield, West Virginia. And his name was Jack Booth. And um, what did he say? That he said that when he was in the Army, just a kid, in the Army, he was at Roswell when this thing, whatever it was, crashed. And he said that it was, uh, he was there pulling guard duty when they went out to the crash site uh, on a truckload of them to get debris up and whatnot. And that he was there when they actually did recover the bodies and he was standing there. He said, and I'm telling you, he said they put little bitty guys in body bags and he said they weren't humans. He said they were just little odd looking fellows, you know, he said they weren't nothing like a human and they put them in body bags and uh, one or two of them were still conscious or alive or something like that from the crash. There were survivors. There were actual survivors from this crash according to him now. I just remember him just saying they were just a little bitty, you know, non-human uh, beings. Uh, I don't remember if he said how tall they were. They were picking up all the little pieces and he said they actually put them guys down shoulder to shoulder on their hands and knees and went across this, the debris area picking up any little speck and scrap of anything that they had. And they'd done it for days, you know, for days. And that they were all threatened. He said they just came right out and said, you know, look, you see anything about this and you might just turn up missing tomorrow. But he did say that, that they were you know, they didn't, you know, make any bones about it and came right to the point about letting them know that how, uh, you know, much they wanted to keep this, you know, under wraps. But he said, I'm telling you, he said, I was there. This would have been uh, 1979, maybe, 1980, yeah. John Michael Murphy. He was a Marine Corps corporal when I was in the Navy. He was stationed down there at the uh, security barracks at Sinclair Fleet. He's part of the security detail there for the base. And um, Murphy had swore him down uh, that uh, earlier when he was over in, uh, in the, still in the Marine Corps, that he had guarded, actually guarded a spaceship, uh, an extraterrestrial craft or whatever you want to call it, at a facility not far from Dover Air Force Base uh, over in Delaware. And um, knowing Murphy as I did, yeah, I'd believe him. I'd, I'd believe Murphy. It was kind of grayish foil-like, uh, maybe eight to ten inches long. I can't remember. Uh, it seemed giant-like when I saw it because it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this before. And, and all eyes uh, were, were just peeled on that particular thing. And when he told us what it was, it. Uh, it was frightening.